morning, everyone. We are uh, about one full lecture behind now, and I'm going to make matters slightly worse because a lot of announcements have piled up. And one of them is that the week after the midterm, you know that the midterm is a week from Thursday, and uh, everyone who's on CourseWeb got those two documents that sort of help with uh, what kind of IDs you want to be aware of. Now, uh, is there anybody who would like to have that on hard copy for any reason? You didn't get one probably yet. You got it. Okay. Good. Oh, that's right. I put it. Okay. So we'll just leave it at that for now. We'll somewhere we'll save a twig, which reminds me we might be having a talk about the Oak Grove Satyagraha next week. But uh, that will help for the midterm and after the week after the midterm, we'll do a diagnostic, and then on that Thursday, whatever topic we're discussing, I, that's when I would like to have the proposals from you for what you're going to write on for your paper. So let me remind you how I, how I recommend that people go about writing a paper. You latch on to some topic that intrigued you and you, we did not have enough time to get into it in class. And Think it over, do some background reading about it. And the second stage is you come up with a statement of some kind that you're going to try to prove or disprove uh, about that topic, right? So a lot of people go through the first stage but not the second and they hand us this proposal and they say, I want to write about Chipko. Now I'm not going to say, no, Chipko is bad. Don't write about Chipko. But I can't really help you until you decide what it is you want to say about it. You want to say, I'm going to try to show that CHIPCO is a model, environmentally based, anti-hegemonic, modern, nonviolent movement, ABCD. And then I can say, that's a pretty good idea. That's intriguing. Why don't you look at this, that, and so forth. So make sure you go through those two things. And the other thing you have to make sure of is that you are dealing with nonviolence because – you know, just talk about something you don't like, even though you dislike it intensely. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's violent. And even if it did, it doesn't necessarily mean you're saying anything about nonviolence. Okay? And the other <coughs> main guideline, I guess, to have in mind is don't try to exhort anyone to do anything. If you shouldn't have to do that, if you state your case well, the case should be so obvious that by the time the reader puts the paper down, he or she says, well, that does it. I'm going to India next week. I'm going to join the Chipko movement. I'm totally convinced or something like that. So in other words, we already know that you know, Gandhi is the greatest and Gandhi's scholars are only slightly less great. Uh, <laughs> Nonviolence is the salvation of humankind. We know that. So you don't have to hype it. You just have to lay it out. So if you give us a good proposal on th the Thursday, the 22nd of March, we'll get it back to you the next week. We should be in good shape in carrying on the conversation. Okay. Uh, I had an interesting, funny little adventure. Uh, Friday, I got an email, obviously a mass email, from somebody in the Homeland Security Department, Department of Homeland Security saying, do you do radicalization? I said, do I do radicalization? <laughs> I do nothing. But I said, no, actually. I uh, answered uh, him right away and said, uh, not specifically my expertise is in nonviolence. And I got a, an email back like in half an hour saying, thank you for your prompt reply. <laughs> I'm sure we will never hear from this person again. So he will never find out that I actually have gone on record stating that I will not obey the Patriot Act. If you ever found that out, we would have a very interesting conversation. Um, other side of the bars. Um, let's see. Uh, we're going to be talking, I hope, <laughs> in a little while about restorative justice. Uh, I was struck by a, an article in the paper which I accidentally casually read just walking by the table, you understand. Uh, there is a picture of a woman sitting on one side of the table holding hands with two people who are holding hands 
with an older man on the other side of the table. He had a serious drunk driving record. He got completely plastered one night that nobody would come take him home. So he left the bar driving in his pickup truck. He was so drunk that he saw somebody riding on a bicycle and probably deliberately swerved into that person and killed him. And he was the husband of this woman. So this is a meeting to try to arrange some kind of rapprochement between them. So that is an example of one of the practices that we follow in the general area of restorative justice. And it was actually going, going on there in Santa Rosa with a photograph in the Press Democrat. It was, it was very really – you could see the emotional turmoil that both of them were going through and that the mediators, mediators were trying to get them, get them over. This is very, very intense. Um, Okay, tonight I will be giving a talk at the Jesuit School of Theology right here in Berkeley, a uh, couple of blocks from here actually, in the Manresa Lounge. I think Manresa is a city where um, Ignatius of Loyola had a vision or spent a lot of time in a cave or something like that. Anyway. It's now a lounge <laughs> in Berkeley, just like the free speech movement is now a cafe. And that will be – actually, I'm starting around 6.45 and going till 8 o'clock tonight. And the address is 1735 Leroy, Le Roy. And the title of the talk is Bridging Spiritual Practice and Social Change. I promise to get to that topic, although I probably won't be spending my whole time on it. You know me. And th there's a notice if you want any. Uh, almost finished. The only other announcement is to say that I got two very interesting announcements right before I left my office this morning that I didn't have a chance to send you yet. And I will be sending them to you real soon. But I also wanted you to know that the Joan B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice at the University of San Diego is having internships this summer. You may or may not be aware of this. The Joan B. Kroc Institute is the – by far the most heavily funded peace and justice academic center in the U.S., possibly in the world. Twenty-six million dollars worth of hamburgers went into funding that this institute. Is, uh, this is McDonald money. Basically, so I find this extremely funny and somehow very gratifying. Uh, so I, uh, I've spoken down there. It's an extremely beautiful place, interesting outfit, and I think you could have a good experience there. They don't serve hamburgers anymore having an internship. Okay, I wanted to now move on to wrapping up some loose ends of things that we've been talking about but didn't finish. I wanted to – come off a comment that uh, Sandra made, a friend from Costa Rica when she was here. You remember it? she was – when she was told that they were going to start a women's group, specifically women's group, her first reaction was, I don't need this. A me me gustan los hombres. <laughs> she said, I'll leave you to work out the <laughs> translation of that. But uh, the point is that she thought – she said, I thought this was about all of us getting together. Why do we have to be just us? And it's an interesting issue and very, very important. It's kind of critical in how we're going to get the world put back together given that major top-down institutions have all failed. And yes, I include universities in that sweeping generalization. Take me out for a latte and I'll tell you why. But as we rebuild the world, we have to understand what kind of unity it's going to have. And of course, the, the concept – we'll be getting back to this toward the end of the semester – is unity and diversity. And what we often find is that people have to be distinctly themselves before they can really merge with others. So it's almost a question of timing. And we can see this perhaps better – I'm here borrowing a technique from Plato you'll instantly recognize. We can see this better on a big scale. 
it was very important for Gandhi that India should develop a sense of its nationhood. So nationalism was very important for him. But at when the time came, he was getting ready to drop nationalism and move on to a different kind of way of being in the world. But you had to get to nationalism before you got beyond it. So this is a parallel, if you will, to what I think this women's group is going through. They have to act and be together as women to discover specifically what capacities and liabilities, they, if any, they may have as women before they move past these specific liabilities and capacities and connect up with the rest of the world. And I would say that's true even of the individual, that you have to know who you are before you can be at one with everybody. What is the one that you're bringing to merge into the whole? I, there is a, a s colleague of mine whose work we're going to be talking about in a little bit. He is a Gandhian scholar, Manfred Steger. And he has a book called Gandhi and Nationalism, which is, I think, pretty darn good on that book. We're going to be talking about his work on globalization pretty soon. Now, of course, what happened uh, for Gandhi actually was, in many cases, people latched on to the nationalism and never got a way of latching off of it. So as his famous comment, I got on the train to Rishikesh and they got off in Delhi. In other words, he was heading for a spiritual revolution. The minute they saw that they were getting some political power, they seized onto that, thought this is as far as we have to go. Okay? So this by way of a comment on what Sandra said. Uh, it's an interesting – not a dilemma, but it's not a simple matter. Should we be our specifically ourselves or should we not? It's not that simple. We have to transitionally, provisionally know exactly who we are as an individual, as a category, and then when we know who we are, we can move out to that and be part of the whole. <coughs> so I, uh, it's a kind of Swadeshi, I guess. And that's why Martin Luther King said, you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be, and I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. So I try to make you into me, which I'm trying to resist the temptation to do. <laughs> and of course, it's an occupational hazard for teachers, right? If I try to make you into me, we'll both lose because I'll lose the specific contribution that you are and you can make. So, so much for Sandra's uh, remark, and I am waiting for uh, material from them so that we can go further into what exactly the people in Costa Rica are doing. I now want to say a little bit more about third-party nonviolent intervention. Uh, for kind of a background history, you do have the, this, what, this old classic in your reader by Charlie Walker called A World Peace Guard. Totally out of print. You'll never see that book anywhere unless you come and take me out for uh, a latte to the FSM and ask me to bring a copy. It's very, very hard to come by. And Charlie himself passed away a few years ago. But in between the Shanti Sena experiments of Gandhi and the modern adventures in third-party nonviolent intervention, there was an attempt to create what they were calling a world peace guard. And just to give you one example of how it was working or not working, and this was actually while Gandhi was still very much in the body. I, if I have my dates right, it was sometime in the early 1930s the Japanese invaded Manchuria. People were very much afraid that the Second World War was going to come out of this, which did. And there was an, a woman, an Anglican minister actually in uh, Britain named Maud Royden who decided that what we should do is collect 10 or 15,000 people, get them to Manchuria right away, and position them in between the Japanese and the Manchu Chinese. And so she thought Gandhi would be totally thrilled with this concept. Um, he, I don't think, ever made a comment on it directly, but uh, Mahadev Desai and other people that she spoke to said to her, you pacifists are trying to use a weapon which you have not got. In other words, you haven't done the training, you haven't learned you know, how to do this with the strategy, strategic thinking, 
You just want to rush in and put human bodies on the line. And we now know that this does not work very well. In the Balkan conflict, there were people who saw a notice in a bar late at night saying that the next morning a ship was leaving Brindisi and taking you over to the Balkans so that you could be a peacekeeper. And so after three or four hours of sleep, they staggered onto the ship the next morning. And they were a terrible liability because they were disorganized. They had to be fed. They had to be housed. They didn't know the language. They knew nothing. Worst of all, they had to be protected. And so there, were, there was both disastrous failures and moderate successes in the Balkan peace team operation. So Gandhi, interestingly enough, and his people were dubious about this. And while they were waiting and trying to get it together, the, the battle spread out over a wide front and it became impossible. So I guess I'm making two points. The dream has never died and probably never will. But the implementation has not as yet been well understood. There is one dimension. I, I could talk about third-party nonviolent intervention a lot because I've been working on it for a long time and I think it's really the coming thing and the way to go. But uh, we need to move on to other topics. So I just want to mention another dimension of it. Uh, and that is a semi-technical term that peace movement people bandy about called interpretation. And so how does this work? For example, mm, going over now to civilian-based defense, which is the sister strategy of TPNI. You have this one historic example that people in the field tend to know about, and that is Prague Spring, Czechoslovakia, 1968-69. Pretty darn successful. If you read standard historical accounts of it, you will get almost no mention of the fact that this is we know this is a thing. It's called civilian-based defense, and then here's the organization that tells you how to do it, and so forth. As a result. People risk their lives and in some cases lose them and in some cases have these brilliant successes and the world never finds out about it. The world never finds out about it for two reasons. They don't hear about it at all and if they did, it would not fit into a frame that they can cognize. You know, there's this thing about human beings and I think that applies to most of us in this class as well as the television audience that in order to understand something, you need a frame of reference for it to land in. Now let me give you a kind of sad example of this. And uh, Adam, I, ho I hope you don't mind. I had a very distinguished colleague in political science and we went out to lunch one time. We were, we were, we were good buddies. And I started telling him about third-party nonviolent intervention. We've got about 20 organizations doing this. It's incredibly powerful. Nobody's been killed so far. Everybody we've accompanied has been protected. And he was amazed. I mean, I mean this man was one of the world's foremost authorities in the sort of peace area of international studies within political science. I mean, he, he had a fantastic reputation. And he's saying to me, Mike, that's what he called me. He said, <laughs> he said, Mike, this is amazing. So I said, yeah, I, th I thought so, Ernie. So I'll tell you what. Why don't you pull together a little seminar, you know, with your colleagues and I'll come and lay it out for them. And he said, no. I said, excuse me, Ernie, what did you say? <laughs> he, sa he said, no. Well, I went back and we're trying to figure out what's going on here. Took him out to lunch again. This is getting expensive. <laughs> and... <laughs> Ran it by him again. You know, said, you know, it's very easy for me. You just pull, just say, there's going to be a seminar in 223 Moses River. I'll come talk about this. No. So I said, do you mind telling me why not? He thought for a while because uh, he really was trying to f formulate, formulate why this wouldn't work. And finally he said, it's not their culture. It's not their culture, whatever that means. So <coughs> our job – is to create an alternative culture in which these things would make sense and we would notice them, understand them, and do them in that order. 
So for that reason, uh, you have people doing these wonderful things. Uh, you have a handful of people in Guatemala whose presence makes it possible for you to have a peace process in that country. Amazing leverage, tremendous effectiveness. Nobody knows about it. As a result, when PBI says, okay, we've protected these people, they can now live, they move on, the country in one way or another degenerates back into the same old, same old. Things are very, very bad in Guatemala right now. You heard David Hartso mention that it's one of the countries that nonviolent peace force is thinking of going into. And that's because our – I think she's our assistant director, I'm not sure um, – is from Guatemala and she's now receiving death threats for the second go-round. So interpretation means you tell people what happened and you explain why it happened so that they get to understand it and enlarge their frame of reference. And it's – of all the dimensions of building third-party nonviolent intervention, I would say interpretation thus far is the weakest. It's even weaker than training, which I went on and on about last week. I don't know why I abuse you people so much sometimes, but I do get on these hobby horses and ride them. I think training is a weak point, but interpretation is in a way even weaker because you have people do these incredible things at great cost to themselves and then it doesn't do anything in terms of changing the world's mentality. So to get from here to the dream of John Paul Lederach, the Mennonite historian, uh, of 250,000 uh, interveners, very, very difficult. I was at a talk in the United States Institute of Peace back in the 90s uh, about peace teams as we were calling it then. And I was complaining about the fact that when there was a famine in Somalia, the Marines went in to take foodstuffs to Somalia and leading to Black Hawk Down and all the rest of it. So I said, why is it that it has to be you military people? He said, tell me who else is organized enough to put 30,000 men with a supply line in the Horn of Africa inside of one week. No one. There's just no one else has built up an institution to the point where they can do this. So that's why we really – you know, there has to be kind of a tipping point where what we're hoping to do with Nonviolent Peace Force is pick an intervention which we can succeed in, go ahead and succeed, and then turn around and tell people what happened. It has to be a place where people are actually giving some attention, a conflict that's getting attention. Now one of the, the – I guess the main, re main reason that we're not doing interpretation, we're not doing it nearly enough, is the demand is so urgent as David was – giving you uh, to understand it's been one of the most painful things that we've been through is the minute you announce that you exist, you get urgent, urgent appeals from 12, 15 countries. Please come help. We need you. And we don't have the wherewithal to do it. So we have to go through this horrible triage which is so painful I can hardly tell you. We have to say we can't come into your country because we'd be – just wiped out. We'd, we'd be creamed. That wouldn't work. Can't come into your country because nobody's paying attention to your conflict. I'm terribly sorry. We have to do one where it will – A, it'll work. B, we'll be, there's a credible uh, network on the ground that we can help them survive and then get out. Time, as you were rightly pointing out, how to, to leave is important. And thirdly, that people will know about it. So. That's one of the main reasons we aren't doing interpretation. Arby? Uh, yeah. Um, well, the hope is that if we can get the, the category in people's minds, do a conspicuous intervention that works and then say to people, do you know what that was? It's called third-party nonviolent intervention. Any, any French literature majors here? You know there's a famous scene in a play of 
Moliere where he's getting rhetoric lessons and he's talking to his wife and she said, he says to his wife, do you know what you just said? And she said, no, what did I say? She said, c'est de la prose. You're speaking prose. Did you know that? So <laughs> it's kind of like that. We have to say to people, you know, they're going to be saying, oh my gosh, what happened? What a fluke. Where did these people come from? We're, stay calm. Don't tear your hair out. You know, Nagler, you can't afford it. <laughs> and say <laughs> calmly <laughs> say to them, uh, oh yeah, no, it, this is a thing. It's called third party. Actually, it's about 50 years old, you know, but the reason you didn't hear about it, then you lay out your whole thing. When that happens, people will be more alert uh, through the next one. And yeah, we can't solve all the conflicts that are going on right now, but if we solve the right conflict in the right way and do the interpretation, people understand it, we'll be able to prevent the next one. That's the hope. So I wouldn't say that any conflict is hopeless. It's always possible that people could wake up and figure out uh, how to resolve it creatively, but it's – you know, in practical terms, it's often very, very difficult in the prevailing culture. Okay. So uh, one of the first things that Nonviolent Peace Force did, even before we were able to put a team uh, as a pilot project in Sri Lanka, was to write a – do a study, a serious in-depth study for about a year and a half on – the do's and the don'ts, the history, the theory of third party intervention. And we very cleverly, because we had the whole world at our disposal, whom do you choose if you want a really thorough research study done? A German. So we had this wonderful woman, Christine Schweitzer, and she did a thorough total job of laying out uh, – I'm not making a, a, an ethnic slur here. Just <laughs> happens to be part of their educational system. They sh we have this wonderful document on the web which lays out the history from a pragmatic standpoint of how this thing works. And it's on, the on our website. So even if we never saved any lives, and already we've saved a lot, relatively speaking, and even if we never grew, we've done something to increase the culture, to use that famous term. Okay. So I am now going to, with some regret, move on to uh, our next topic, which was slated for last Thursday, which is restorative justice. And I will do that as soon as you feel you don't have any questions left about third-party nonviolent intervention. In other words, do you have any more questions about <laughs> before we move on? Yes, Catherine. Um, so yeah. Interpretation means. <laughs> Do you want me to define it a little? Bit? Yeah. So interpretation means. Did I spell it wrong? Interpret. Oh, shh. it's. And uh, here's everybody in the world is watching this. This is embarrassing. <laughs> It's very hard to <laughs> spell when you – is that okay now? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I didn't get a PhD in comparative literature for nothing. <laughs> now, it, the blackboard is inside my focal length when I turn around, so I think it's hard for me to spell. Yes, it's interpretation. Okay, and, um, the, definition? the definition is uh, creating a framework of understanding <laughs> in which, in the present case, Third party intervention, third party nonviolent intervention can be grasped. Let me put it that way. You have this wonderful verb in Dutch, begrijpen, which to understand <laughs> means to grab a hold of and take in. Yeah. Uh, because if you don't have that framework, you can see event after event after event go by. And even if the press told you what happened, which they won't do that in the first place, but even if they did, you wouldn't recognize it. You wouldn't acknowledge it as something important. It's like advertising. They know that in advertising, they have to hit you with an idea th at least three times before you actually conceive the desire to buy happiness or freedom in the form of their product. Okay. 
the first time it's, it's just going to go by. Yeah. Yes? To build, to build it. That's a very good question. What are the strategies that we could use or are trying to use to help people get this framework? Uh, the whole thing is so new that I, I don't know if we can generalize about it. But the way I've always thought – oh, yeah, and I wanted to say something. Oh, thank you, Zoe. The way I've always thought about it is we're trying to lay out the history, the theory – and the wait, history I – guess, I guess those two will do, actually. History and the theory. What happened and why it happened. And um, so I, I always start from the basic framework of principle of nonviolence. And I say even in conflict there is a part of people that did not want to be in that conflict. But – in the normal course of events, conflict is very polarizing and that means it's me against you. The minute a third party is on the scene, it's no longer just me against you anymore. That breaks up the mental framework that the conflict is happening in. And you can do – you can systematically build on this. You can do it deliberately. So it's the theory and the history that we work on. And now, incidentally, back on the training piece for just a second. Matthias had a question last week, how do you do this training? I've always thought that we should think of training – that's T-R-A-I-N-I-N-G on, – on three levels. <laughs> There's region-specific – S-P-E-C-I <laughs> – which is things like language and culture, like, you know, don't insult Muhammad when you're in an Islamic country. You know, think things like that <laughs> low-grade morons should, should understand. But there's all, all kinds of things like how to do business in, in a Japanese country is totally different from how you do it in, in the West. And I remember hearing about a training film that was being shown to oil – workers going over to the Mideast, it turns out that the, in the West, the uh, personal envelope is about 24 inches. In other words, when you go up to talk to somebody for ordinary purposes, you tend to stand about 24 inches away from them. But in the Middle East, it's about 16 inches. So here's this uh, American businessman. He's had this long conversation with a sheikh and he gets up to shake hands. And the sheikh moves into within his envelope, which is 16 inches. The American backs up <laughs> to reestablish 24. And the sheikh moves in again. They're basically, they're chasing each other around the table. <laughs> so you have to know some things about how each culture works in, an, in order to operate in that culture. I don't want to sort of list out all the mistakes that the American military has made in the Middle East, but I'll leave that up to you for imagination. So that's one thing. And then the next thing. Underneath that, which could apply anywhere, are conflict resolution techniques. And this is a growth industry now. Every major town has a mediation center and they can spell out for you certain practices that work and certain ones that don't work when you have a dispute. How to do it with a third party, how to do it without a third party. All this stuff is pretty well known. Now within conflict resolution strategies, there are some that are specific to international work and TPNI. One of them is you're in there – one of the tasks that you're providing, you're performing in, when you're in intervention as a th cross-border intervener is witnessing and recording. So one of the most powerful tools that you have is your camera. But there are moments in every conflict where Privacy is essential and if you even hint that outsiders are going to know about what you're doing, they will either clam up or what's worse, they will smash your camera and maybe smash you. So you, there's a specific subset of skills and a friend of mine, Lizzie Brock, has written a little booklet on these that you learn within the conflict resolution arena. And then the deepest one of all is some kind of spiritual discipline. 
And that's the really hard part to spell. I mean, uh, <laughs> to, to talk about and promote publicly because it's a very private matter. But as Thich Nhat Hanh said, you may be dedicated to nonviolence, but once you get into the conflict and it's happening, you're going to draw. You're going to forget that you ever had nonviolence. You need something deeper. Basically, what you need, if you re remember back to our friend, the mother in Chile, who talked about her anger being converted into rage, being converted into work, which overcame fear. Remember that wonderful dynamic. You need a mechanism that's built into your unconscious mind that does that automatically, so that when anger and fear come up, they go through this wonderful conversion. It's called Pax 94, right? Here you go. <laughs> okay. Any other questions then about uh, third party intervention? Yes, Jenna. Um, yeah, uh, Jenna's asking how can we tell that it's a conflict that people will care about? Well, the crude way is to start with one that they care about already. You know, there's a fair amount of attention on Palestine and almost nothing on Tibet. There's a fair amount of attention and where else do we have sort of a – not thinking about just a war, but – well, I guess for, for a certain period of time, there was a fair amount of attention on the color revolutions in Eastern Europe. So whenever somebody got poisoned, <laughs> that was reported in the paper. And when there was a big mob in Georgia or Uzbekistan, people were looking at it. But people are paying absolutely no attention to the women of Namibia. And very, very little to Nigeria. So I don't think at this point we have the capacity to focus attention. The only thing we can do is to go where it is already focused. And I'm not saying this is the only criterion that we would apply. I mean, if there's a – gosh, if there's a place where we could save a lot of human lives and help a country stabilize, we're going to go there even if nobody's paying attention. But for it to have long-term significance, we have to get the attention out there. Now, having said that, in what's different about the last 10 or 12 years is – who needs the mass media anymore? We have alternative media now uh, for a couple – well, maybe for $1,000, $1,500, you could turn a field team member into a walking, real-time, streaming, YouTube, <laughs> whatever it is, <laughs> the next thing going on. So, you know, they'll be in there. They'll have this little device clipped on them. and. People back in the States will be watching it on the, in the bar where they're, <laughs> where they're drinking. I mean, well, no, that'll take a little while. But, but you know what I mean? There, there are ways that we're rebuilding a whole new way of communicating, which is going to, I hope, it very soon render the mainstream media irrelevant. I know we're within earshot of Northgate Hall, but I still I've said it and I'm glad. Yes, Arby? I think the answer to that question is no. And the reason is partly because I don't think people are aware enough of how important awareness is. You pardon me being kind of cute here, but people are so fixated on the physicality of the situation, which God knows is compelling, that they forget that it's a mental situation also. And if you could change minds, you would change behaviors very rapidly and very efficiently. So that's one problem. And, and another is, as I say, once you get into this work, you get so caught in what you're able to do for people that – you know, I, I guess there's also a third thing that makes it difficult is that uh, I remember talking to Lizzie Brock, the woman who did the booklet that I mentioned in this connection, coming back from Colombia, one of the most brutal conflict areas in the world today. And she was okay as long as she was thinking in Spanish. But after being back in the States for a couple of days, she started thinking in English again. And then she started hearing 
her thoughts, if you will, and she was no longer used to it. And she was hearing what she was actually saying. And she was traumatized by that. It was very, very difficult. So one of the things that we've learned is when you bring a team back or a person back from a team, unlike the American military, which says bye-bye, you have to take care of that person. They need to, be to readjust emotionally as well as you know, getting you know, $600 or something to get them back into the culture. So there's really a new area where we're learning a lot. But the answer, unfortunately, is no. There is no single organization dedicated to doing the interpretation uh, except it might be meta. <laughs> like that's one of, the, one of the reasons I'm so keen on doing this work. Okay. I think there was one other – okay. All right. Let's, let's move on. And as usual, you know, the stuff is cumulative. We can come back to it. And as you figured out by now, it does not take much to get me talking about uh, TPNI. So anytime things are getting slow, uh, just say, TPNI, and off we will go. <laughs> so um, – we want to move on to a rather different area of operations, which the term for which is restorative justice. And you have some really good readings selected for you in the reader. I think if I had to define it in one snappy phrase, I would pick one that's already been used in a different connection. And that phrase would be justice as if people mattered. Is retributive justice is really justice as if people don't matter, abstractions do. Um, maybe it's worth talking about the concept of justice for just a minute or two. We take it for granted that we all know what justice is. And you get into a conversation about it. You discover even in your own culture, you discover that that's not so easy. There's different definitions of justice, distributive, and so on. And people make a living talking about this. They're called ethicists, and I'm not going to try to encroach on their field. But you have an even greater shock when you go over to different cultures. And I remember hearing a talk on a certain region, a uh, Himalayan region that's on the border between – uh, Tibet and India, a, a talk by Helena Norbert Hodge, and the name of this region is Ladakh. And I don't know why she had originally gone there, but she spent quite a bit of time there. And in the period of the, I'm talking about the late 80s, she was kind of making this her shtick. She was going around saying, talking everywhere about what she was discovering there because it was, uh, it was not a subsistence culture. Even though it was way up there on the Himalayan plateau, these people had they, – they had enough to survive on plus excess. So they did beautiful art and things like that. And, but they lived in smallish villages and she noticed something very interesting while she was there, which is pertinent to us. She was with a villager who lived in this little hut and – a sack of rice, a big sack of rice was stolen from him and his family. The village being small, everybody knew who stole the rice. Unlike the person who stole my bicycle last week, we have no idea. Yes, thank you. I thought I deserved a little sympathy for that. Uh, <laughs> we had no way of finding out who that person was. Uh, but in a village, everybody knows who stole the rice, so she thought, that the victim would just march up to this person's house and say, that's my bag of rice. And because a bag of rice, I mean a big sack, it's important. You live in the Himalayas. You've got to keep your family alive. It's not a joke. But the person didn't do it and he didn't do it. And finally she said to him, why don't you confront him and get your rice back? He said, because I have to live in this village. In other words, the relationship is more important than the object. So if they could stay bonded as friends, as members of the community, 
that is a more important value, even a more important survival value than recovering this one sacrifice. Okay. So Helena's way of putting that was they care more about relationships than and community. They care more about community than they do about justice. But I would say they have a different concept of justice. That's how I would look at it. And so now, of course, you're dying to hear what my definition of justice is. And I will not frustrate you any further. The definition which I just came up with in the Free Speech Cafe right after you left, Zoe, <laughs> is justice is an agreed upon set of norms that move the individual and society toward, quote, loving community, unquote, towards a more perfect union where peace spontaneously is maintained within that framework, within that society, whatever it is. So justice is whatever gets you there. <coughs> now, if, if this is a definition of justice, then to say retributive justice is like saying martial law. As you know, when martial law was declared in the Punjab in the 1920s, Gandhi said they have just declared martial law, which means no law at all. The point of law is to create a stability which would not require the use of force or threat. So the use of force it kind of cancels, rules out the prevailing uh, law. Um, so if you look at page 141 of your reader, which I was clever enough to bring with me today. Um, yeah. The basic assumption about the relationship between criminal justice and punishment needs to be re-examined. This is the right-hand side of that page. Punishment is the deliberate infliction of suffering. It is legal violence. So this book claims that punishment is counterproductive and needs fresh examination and so forth. So in a nonviolent order, there is basically – I'm saying basically it's a slight hedge. It's going to be a slight margin for this, but very, very slight. There is basically no place for punishment. You, know, you remember the famous uh, illustration of that in the very early days in one of the two settlements in which he lived in South Africa. Some of the uh, teenagers, the young adults misbehaved. I mean, probably they smoked a cigarette or something like that. And he found out about it. He felt he had to do something about it. But he was – came up against a dilemma because he felt in an ashram, punishment is not appropriate. So he figured out that the thing to do was to take the suffering on himself. And he fasted. And when he did that, it had an amazing eye-opening effect on the teenagers. So you know, we've discussed that example and some others. Um, so it's – restorative justice is justice as if people mattered and their community matters. And there's a very neat, catchy way that one of the restorative justice workers in this country uh, who operates in the South has put it. In retributive justice, when somebody has committed an infraction against the community, you say, hey, get out of here. And you create an area where that person lives sequestered from the rest of society. Whereas in restorative justice, what you do is you say to that person, hey, get back in here. And you create a framework for them to do that. L yeah, Zoe? Well, this is really a good question. Hard question, <laughs> but a good question. 
Zoe is saying, can a culture or even a group become so dehumanized that your willingness to suffer and perhaps your suffering would not open their eyes in the way that I just described? I'm going to give you a good academic answer to that, which is yes and no. <laughs> what I mean is this. You can definitely dehumanize people to the point where they would not show any reaction. But I believe – and this is just a belief. Hang on one second, uh, Ahmed. I believe that it is impossible for the other person not to be touched at all, and I would invoke the mirror neuron <laughs> phenomenon for that. You know, even against their will, some of them neurons are going to be firing off. Um, so what we try to do is not let things deteriorate so badly, not try to have to – not be in a position where we have to intervene at such a late stage that the person will not be consciously aware of what's going on inside of them. But my – I mean, personally, I do not believe that a person can be so closed off that nothing would happen. If they were, they would – you know, they'd get to be the president. I, I, no, no, no. If they were, they'd – you know, it would be like they'd be catatonic <laughs> or something like that. Ahmed? Okay, this is a very fair question because I've been using the term a lot and it would be probably a good idea to know what it means. And the reason that it's not a snap to define is that it's a funny thing and it cuts both ways. I guess the best way to approach it would be to say that dehumanization means a breaking of contact with human community. The reason I want to put it that way is you cannot lose sight of the humanity of another without losing sight of your own. This is one of the big discoveries that's happened in nonviolence. I mean, you can go around saying, we are important and you're nothing, but you're really denying your own importance as a person when you do that. And when I say – the humanity of another, I guess a simple way to look at that is that they can suffer and their suffering matters. Now, it's, it's kind of funny that it, it in, the, in the realm of animal rights, which we were scheduled to move on to at some point and we may, uh, one of the arguments that animal rights people make is it's not – whether animals can think or whether they have rights, but whether they can feel. If they can feel, we do not want to inflict pain on them. So – but I'm saying a human, I guess I'm not saying that it's limited to Homo sapiens sapiens. But if you remember – this is – your question has made me kind of grope around for an answer, Ahmed, and that's good. I, Hope you're enjoying my discomfort up here. <laughs> you know, the Buddha said, and Jain thinkers have also said, even the meanest creature wants to live. Even the meanest creature avoids pain. Therefore, do not kill or cause to kill. That's one of, I think, the most profound aphorisms of the Buddha. So when you have another person at your mercy and you inflict suffering on them and you think you're enjoying it, you're denying their humanity. Maybe not on the intellectual level. Maybe if you took a, a survey afterwards and the questionnaire said, do you think that your prisoner suffered? And you said, oh, yeah, ha, ha, suffered a lot. It was great. <laughs> but really, you'd be cut off from it. You would not know what you were saying. Absolutely not. You know, suffering here does not only refer to physical violence. In fact, uh, in the studies of media violence and how it uh, hurts people, they discovered a couple of interesting things. One is 
that it makes absolutely no difference whether you think the violence you're watching is real or it's just an image. In other words, whether it's, quote, news or, quote, entertainment makes virtually no difference, even in adults. You see a scene of violence, it's going to damage you. What does make a difference is what is being violated. If it's a relationship between strangers where there hardly is any relationship, the hurt is limited. It's minimal. But if it's a close relationship that's being violated, say inner int intra-family relationship being torn apart, the pain that you go through is much greater. And that, that's – that denial of community on that very deep level is a form of dehumanization. And what are the numbers now? I mean, when I was last reading about this, by the time you were 18 years old, in this country or any imitator thereof, you had been exposed to 200,000 murders on television. So the dehumanization is really serious. I mean, the mere fact that we can still you know, relate to each other at all, it's, it's a testimony to the resilience of the human spirit. But in my book, you all read that episode uh, to which a friend of mine owes her very existence where – I mean, her parents were Polish, Jewish. Uh, they were living in uh, Warsaw. They were members of the underground. Gestapo was tipped off, raided the apartment, found all of this incriminating stuff, was about to take them away. I don't think you can imagine anyone less sympathetic to another human being than – the captain of a Gestapo unit having some Jews that he just discovered were part of the underground in Poland. So the situation is as worse as it could be. But just at that moment, they had this two-and-a-half-year-old boy and he walks over to this Gestapo captain. He doesn't know what's going on. He just sees these shiny brass buttons on his uniform and he's playing with the buttons. And the captain looks down and sees this. And of course, the parents are absolutely horrified. And he looks up and he's a completely changed person. And he says, I have a little boy at home just his age and I miss him very much. And he said, your son has saved your life. And he turned around and walked out, took his men out of the apartment. So this is why I'm saying – I guess it was your question, R.B. I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> it, I don't think anyone can be so dehumanized that there is no way that they could be reached. In this case, it wasn't precisely the suffering but the innocence of the little boy that woke him up. But it can be very, very costly and if you can possibly avoid it, you don't want to let things get that far. Okay. So um, as we've seen over and over again, the underlying principle in all aspects of nonviolence is that all of us matter. And if you have a system that has to deny that some people matter, it's not going to work. It's not going to take us to a nonviolent future. Um, who was it? I think it was Bertrand Russell who said, but it was also said by our very own Berkeley science fiction writer, Ursula Le Guin. That if you ha if you were told, okay, this this might this may be a really good midterm question, Pax 164b. If you were told that you could build paradise right here, you could just everything. I mean, you know, lattes would be flowing in the street, <laughs> sufficiency everywhere. But in order to do it, you would have to sacrifice one innocent child. Would you do it? What's your answer to that question? It's uh, – I have to tell you, I have to forewarn you, it's, it's sort of a trick question. Yeah, Matt? That – that is – okay, Zoe, yeah? Yeah. 
What uh, both of you are saying is very close to the way that I would put it. Um, so let's just put them all together. <coughs> I mean, Matt, is, Matt and Zoe, I think, were saying that you'd be hurting part of yourself. So what kind of paradise would that be? I would uh, amplify that a little bit and say it's a, tr it's a false question because you could not possibly build an order of nonviolence on an act of extreme violence. Means and ends are the same. It just does not work that way. And uh, I think we're saying approximately the same thing. But it is very important to be able to examine the, um, the assumptions – is the word I was looking for – examine the assumptions behind the question. And say the very fact that you came up with that question, buddy, shows <laughs> that you don't know what paradise is. You cannot do this. R.B.? So that is – that uh, for some reason is entirely different. And I'm not sure why, but it has something to do with the fact that apparently according to John Milton and other theologians, God, whoever she or he is, wants us to have free will. And infringing the will of another person is very different from using your own in some interesting way. So yeah, Gandhi would be the first to say life is precious, but there's a point at which we're talking about something more than the physical presence of life in this physical body. And I may have to sacrifice it. But you do not want to get into a situation where you say, we have to sacrifice you for this paradise. John? Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. The COs. I didn't quite catch that. Yeah, but in the film uh, The Good War and Those Who Refused to Fight It, this is what conscientious objectors took on. That, yeah, we would uh, starve ourselves, get ourselves injected with typhoid, you name it, uh, but we would not inflict it on another. That is a qualitatively different act even though, uh, yes, I feel suffering. But I guess the point is this, that when I'm inflicting it in on myself for a higher cause, which I'm not looking to do, incidentally. <laughs> don't, don't try to find me one. Uh, but if I were to inflict it on myself, as we've seen several times in the course of the semester, the pain turns into something else. You know, we talked about this especially last semester when we saw the film A Time for Justice. We talked about whether there was an episode in that film where one of these freedom riders was very, very badly beaten, and he said, You feel the pain but you don't get bitter. And again, it's that bitterness which is where you're focusing it on yourself and saying, this should not be happening to me. So if it's something that you undergo on your own and you're not a masochist because there are such critters, but you undergo it for a higher cause, then it somehow even the physical, the physical suffering is different. So maybe it registers differently in your consciousness. Okay, well this is working exactly the way that I wanted it to work, which is maybe we're connecting the framework of retributive slash restorative justice to the larger issues of nonviolence. Um, so what, let's see, where are we here? There's the general characteristic – oh, I'm sorry. I was about to say that, yeah, we're rooted in the – faith proposition or the frame of reference where every single individual matters and the whole matters. And in a funny way, the whole, even though it's numerically bigger, does not matter more than the individual. And so we reject the whole idea that by sacrificing one individual you can advance society in any serious way. Um, there's one documentary that we're not showing this semester. Actually, there's several. <laughs> But one that I really like and would recommend that you go out and have a look at sometime, it's called Doing Time, Doing Vipassana. And it's about – you may have seen it in your course. It's about – you might want to add to this, Zoe, but it's about a prison in northern India which was very serious. Um, it had 20,000 people in it. I think it was built for 7,000, something like that. There were murders every day practically. 
And in charge of this prison, they put a diminutive woman who did very well there. And at one point, she brought in a man named Essen Goenke, who is the founder of Vipassana meditation, which I think is probably the most popular form of meditation in the world today. Am I wrong? Yeah. What, what is it that you want me to spell? You know I can't even <laughs> spell interpretation <laughs> and you're asking <laughs> what is it? Yeah, Vipassana. That I can spell. If it's not English, I can spell it. <laughs> yeah. And his name is Goenke. But it's a very popular. There's lots of people doing it. It comes – yeah. Doing time, doing vipassana. So this is prisoners. They had prisoners taking a day-long or two or three-day-long vipassana retreat. Right? Here are people who are in the habit of going around killing folks and they have to sit still for most of 48 hours. Yeah. Do you work that in the meditation Not in our meditation class. Maybe in her meditation class. No? Okay. It would be a good idea. You had her here? Okay. We'll talk about it later. The point is – the point that we're trying to make is in Indian culture, meditation, whether people do it or not, is felt to be the most honorific thing that a person can do. So to take a prisoner and tell him, we know that you have the capacity to meditate is like the – in that culture anyway – the most powerful, effective, rapid way of, de of re humanizing that person. And so you see these incredible scenes of these guys staggering out of this retreat. But don't ask me to meditate for three, three days in a row. Uh, staggering out, just push, pouring down tears and embracing the warden. They're totally changed by this. So this is restoration of a very, very powerful kind. Um, The way I would characterize the movement that's trying to build restorative justice is that its, it's constructive program almost entirely and it's a kind of scattered constructive program. It's not pulled into a really tight framework. And so far there's almost no obstructive program in it. There's almost no confrontation. So from my standpoint, what's going to happen in order to make this work is someone or ones – maybe the internet is going to do it for us. No, I don't think so. Someone is going to have to pull this together into one big framework, do a bit of interpretation on it so people know what they're doing and come up with a strategy, right? Okay, we've been explaining this to you for X amount of months and now we want you to do it if you don't we are going to carry out civil disobedience in some way, shape, or form. There's a tiny little bit of civil disobedience happening here and there. Um, for example, there is an organization that I actually I'd like you to know about called Consistent Life Ethic. Uh, what they, their position is that all forms of inflicting violence on life are wrong. They are all to be avoided. And that has given them a position where on the one hand they're against war and the death penalty and stuff like that. And they're also against abortion. It has given them a unique position within the peace movement, the progressive world, whatever you want to call it. Uh, abortion is something that I'd like to talk about with you at some point. But one person who's part of this, a board member and former president of Consistent Life, Mary Ryder, uh, where is this? She and her husband and her seven, their 17-year-old daughter were convicting of trespass in January when they went to the contractor's order uh, office, the contractor of Aero. Uh, which was a company that was ha made small jets and was leasing them to the CIA to carry out, quote, here's one of those euphemisms again, extraordinary renditions, unquote. 
In other words, they needed special planes to take people and carry them to countries where they could torture them. And they went with other anti-torture activists citing, incidentally, some, a principle in law called necessary defense. Have you heard of that? There, there is actually a, a small body of law called peace law and it protects peace activists and necessary defense states that if your welfare would be more threatened by not doing what you're doing, you have the right to do it. So you have the right to perform civil disobedience against a law or a system which you have uh, come to understand is going to harm your welfare and that of society in a serious way. So their point was that the rule of law is being destroyed by the practice of torture and it was in the interest of themselves and the country to perform civil disobedience against it. So similarly, there are some anti-death penalty protests here and there, but mostly it's a question of scattered constructive program. On the other hand, potentially I think restorative justice is – very seditious. It is very destructive to the, frame of the framework of the present culture which says which, – well, I'm going to borrow a term from one of my colleagues here. The, the concept of uh, – if, if I'm going to borrow this term, I better remember it. Oh, yeah. It is <laughs> redemptive violence. The idea that you can fix things by violence is so deeply rooted in our culture that the idea that you can fix them without violence, not to mention that you can only fix them without violence, which is my position, is really a paradigm-busting idea. It, it would just completely break us out of the controlling narratives of our culture. So this movement, even though okay, it looks a lot tamer than insurrectionary revolution, which we started with, it has the potential of overturning the social order in a, at least as powerful – I would maybe even say more powerful a way. Because we've seen in a lot of these in successful un insurrectionary movements, they succeeded but they didn't work the sense that they, they threw out some kind of despotic ruler, but they did not throw out the ideology that brought that ruler to power in the first place. So this is very – this potentially is a very deep change that could be worked in our society. And that's why philosophers like um, uh, uh, – who was it that uh, – Foucault devoted volumes and volumes to the concept of punishment in modern societies. Uh, one of the secondary characteristics that I like a lot about the retributive justice movement is that it has been a way of involving some indigenous input. And that I think is, has to be part of the future where we have to realize that darn it – and I am a PhD in a major research university in the West that's saying this, darn it, the West does not have all the answers. And in some cases, we have to look to other cultures which may be materially and politically less developed than our own by choice or not by choice, and yet they may have something to offer us. So people are looking in uh, Rwanda, for example, in that part of Africa. They're looking at the gachacha court system. Am I pronouncing that right? And the way that that works is people are brought in to confront the entire community, which of course is possible to do if the entire community is a village. And through discussion and through the use of respected elders, they uh, acknowledge that they've committed what we would call a crime you know, some kind of a harmful act against an individual or the community and they work out a retribu retribution. How are we going to fix this? So that's the extremely important assumption behind restorative justice. Just as I have just been saying, no person 
can be so dehumanized that there would not be a way of rehumanizing them. Sometimes it might be impossibly difficult, but there is a way. Similarly, there is nobody – there is no crime for which some restitution could not be devised. Now let me take an even more exciting – that maybe that's the wrong word – moving, dramatic, something like that. Uh, practice, again in sub-Saharan Africa, um, somewhere in the Bemba communities is a practice. Now I have tried to track this down and I have not been able to document it, but that might simply because of what we were talking about earlier today, that people don't have the frame of reference. So they don't notice it when it happens, so they don't write about it. And I even forget where I originally heard about this. So with all of that said, here's this wonderful system that either does or does not happen. But it would certainly very plausible for us. The way it works is here's this tribe, this village, where somebody has done something very wrong, usually a guy. So <laughs> what happens is the entire community sits in a circle with that person either in the middle or in one at the head of the circle. And they go around the circle and everybody in the community has to what? They have to say something good about that person. And what happens is when they're about a third of the way around the circle or at some point, the guy – for it is usually a guy – breaks down <laughs> and said, the he sees his better self and can cling to it and acknowledge his lower self. When that emotional transformation happens, then the whole community can talk about the restitution. Right. Um, other examples of this are found among the Navajo, which is very, very parallel to – whoops, we're running out of time. Uh, I'm going to continue this a little bit on Thursday, but by way of conclusion, I'd like to read you a little bit from a letter that I received from a friend in Florida. Uh, I thought of you staying in touch with me whenever you can, and that really counts to me, my friend Michael said. And that was like seven months ago when I told you I was having trouble with my anger, but now it has gotten so much better. And I have come a long ways with learning how to control my anger. And I no longer feel the pain of anger I once felt, even in the extremely difficult times that I am faced with each day. Uh, every night – you're beginning to catch on where this friend of mine is – every night I go to sleep with dudes talking about violence and I wake up with dudes talking about violence. Everybody wants to be a killer. Nobody wants to be himself. And you are now like family to me because of the insight – because the insight you share with me about nonviolence has somewhat helped me strive to take my life to another level. My friend is in uh, the most uh, high security prison in Florida for the rest of his life. He had been in prison for – 30 years when he first got a hold of my book and started writing to me. Uh, basically his life between the ages of 14 and 18. He had no father in the house, of course. His life between 14 and 18 was basically a crime spree uh, and he got himself locked away forever. He has serious management problems. I've called the people um, in the you know, in the Justice Department in Florida, they said, you know, there's no possible way that you'll ever get him out. And not only is he in prison, but he is in a cell by himself 23 hours a day and he's been there now for 35 years. And yet uh, – so, you know, just ask yourself, what earthly good does this do? Here is a person who has got it. He has caught on. You walk out in the street here and you'll run into quite a few people who understand nonviolence, not as well as Michael McKinney. He totally wants to turn his life around and there's no way that we can reach out to him and help him do it. So let's talk next time about some of the ways that people are going into prisons and then we'll move on to environmental and animal rights stuff. And then we'll be talking about